Bene, buon pomeriggio. Buon pomeriggio. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Thank you very much for being here with us. We're finally together in Flesh and Bones. This is the first event in this industry. Once again, we're all here together, and we will talk about the state of the art. What does that mean? It means taking a snapshot of the situation of this industry after an event which has totally changed things. I'm talking of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and then we will also have here with us the excellence of this industry. And we shall start with figures, trends to see what is happening in this industry, to understand what is happening in economic terms and casting a glance to the fourth quarter and to next year. Let me introduce the people who are here with me. We will start with Stefania Trenti. Welcome, Stefania. Stefania is head of the industry office in in Tesa, San Paolo. Stefan Luce, executive vice president at the Beers for Consumers and Brands. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us. Jean Fabier, CEO of Damiani Group. Welcome, Jerome Fabier. And we have Nicola Rapone, Corporation Senior Director of Jewelry Senior Unit of Bulgari. Welcome also to Massimiliano Fazoli, CEO and Jewelry Designer, as well as Gemologist Fazoli SPA. Right before starting, I would like to leave the floor to Marco Carniello for a few welcoming words. Marco, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I will be very, very quick. When people ask us, how did we manage to be here with the 800 exhibitors? I say, well, we are responsible and accountable. We're a leading fair in the world, so we cannot but be the first ones in this recovery. And secondly, planning. I mean, organizing a fair does not merely mean switching the lights on and the air conditioning. There is much more to this. This is a fruit of a continuous exchange with the market. And then the community. We often hear of communities in the online world, but community is a term that refers to all stakeholders. That is, all those who participate in the fair and contribute to an industry as key opinion leaders, as small and medium enterprises, as researchers, designers, and all those who contribute to the development of our industry. It is important for all these stakeholders to be here in this community. And the term community is best expressed here at our fair, because here we have the key opinion leaders of our community. So thank you very much, Nicolò, Stephen, uh, Mrs. Trenti, Jerome, and welcome, Mr. Fazoli. And talking about the community, we can see that our community is becoming wider and wider. It is a very solid and strong community, but very inclusive. And thanks to Club Degliorafi, we have the opportunity to compare ourselves and exchange ideas with adjacent industries, retail, distribution. And this is fundamental. So thank you very much, President Giorgio Villa, for your support in organizing this event today, this conference. I hope that our relationship will become stronger and stronger because this community is very important for all our community. Giorgio, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Thank you very much and congratulations. I mean, it's not uh, just opening the gates to have a trade fair. I was thinking of a large uh, conference room where you had a meeting one year ago deciding about the opening of the trade fair. You have been courageous and audacious. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you'll be awarded for that. Club degli Orafi. It's a fantastic club. Its mission is the development of jewels and of gold in Italy and in the world. So it's good because it's there to um, foster a culture, to spread information so that people know where we are and what we do, and events like this. 
We have been invited to uh, organize this very interesting talk here with uh, very distinguished speakers and grateful to them, as well as uh, other events that we will develop together with our members. So thank you very much for coming. Um, welcome to all of you who are listening in a streaming channel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giorgio Vela, Club degli Orafin. Thank you, IAG, for the organization. So the whole industry is represented here on the stage. We know that this industry has suffered a lot, more than other economic areas, when in 2020 the pandemic happened. But there is a recovery. So Stefania Trenti can tell us more about this, because every quarter she analyzes all the figures of this industry. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Andrea. Thank you very much to the trade fair. Well, the fact that we are here uh, together in presence, I think it's uh, the most evident sign of the value of vaccination campaigns, which are key to help us and the world economy to go back to normality. Still, there are many uncertainties for the vaccination campaign uh, has not been fully implemented in many countries, and that is necessary to restart international uh, movements. Uh, we know that vaccination has been key to get the world economy restarted. There is a, a huge rebound effect. Uh, the GDP of 2021 is expected to be growing by 7%, confronted with minus 3, 4 of last year, with two driving engines like U the US, China, and many Asian countries. Uh, this very fast restart, which in a way comes unexpected, like a spring, which after being compressed for many months, has bounced back. Uh, with many new problems, such as bottlenecks in the transports, the increase in prices of commodities, the scarcity of uh, raw materials and commodities, that uh, can be overcome in the next quarters. That will be gradual. We are not concerned uh, in terms of uh, uh, the possible uh, restarting of inflation uh, spirals. We know that in many countries the labour market is affected by high levels of unemployment, uh, and that, uh, I think, would uh, prevent uh, uh, the uh, rocket uh, rise of prices. That will enable the uh, coming out from expansive uh, monetary uh, policies, uh, uh, which uh, contributed to the uh, very good results at world level. Now, uh, a few comments on our side. We expect that the US monetary policy could start uh, a bit earlier, and that might have an impact uh, on the exchange rates, uh, uh, euro and dollar, but we could speak of that later. A very uh, high uh, GDP growth in the US and China, and also in Europe. We have reviewed our forecast. We have provisional figures, and the surprises of the second quarter have been positive for Italy, too. The data concerning the second quarter has been have been very good in Italy. It's not the plus 17% as compared with the second quarter of last year. We were all in lockdown. Uh, that uh, might be a statistical uh, uh, rebound. But uh, the Italian economy is, or we expect uh, it could be uh, growing. Now we have 5.7%. We went, might go as up as 6%, but it's consumption services uh, which uh, drive the uh, recovery. Further uh, progresses will depend on uh, the health situation, but we uh, could expect further improvements by the end of this year. Uh, it is important, and it's also having already its effects, uh, is a phenomenon already there in the US, but also in Italy, is the fact that during the lockdown months, uh, a lot of savings were made by Italian families. So contrary to uh, other 
crisis such as uh, 08, 09, uh, sovereign debt, uh, uh, the savings increased a lot. Uh, that is a sort of uh, additional engine that could bring about uh, uh, further uh, or higher growth rates. It's like having a tank which will provide its uh, good effects in the coming months. But, uh, and they tell that to, to you, it's important to uh, stress that there's uh, $70 billion of buffer savings is not equally distributed. So that uh, further strengthen another uh, trend uh, of um, our clock uh, markets uh, with a high uh, range performing very well uh, while the lower uh, layers are looking for savings uh, to the detriment of the central layer. Uh, indeed, uh, this is one of the sectors most affected by the perfect storm. Uh, rocket high price of gold, uh, closing down of shops and industries, no tourism, but everything uh, has restarted very rapidly. These are world data concerning the demand, which uh, got restarted very well in the end of 2020, uh, even better this year, in particular in China and the US. Uh, uh, the average of 2020 in the US was not uh, on the downside. In Italy, uh, uh, the industry has been able to fully grasp all the uh, growth opportunity in the domestic and international markets. In the first six months of the year, the sales of jewelry and uh, customs jewelry has had a growth of 80 percent. That's incredible. But uh, of course, uh, it's interesting to note that we are uh, plus 8 percent as compared with uh, 2019. That means that the industry has fully recovered what it lost during the pandemic. Uh, we have a very strong signals of the restarting of exports. Uh, the uh, main market or the most responsive market uh, for the growth of export is that of the US. And we are well beyond uh, the levels of uh, 2020 and uh, 2019. We also have uh, made comparisons uh, with uh, those of other competitors. Uh, market shares uh, of Italian uh, jewelry, uh, gold jewelry, indicate that over the past uh, years, uh, 2020 included, uh, market shares have been recovered by uh, Italian companies. have uh, been dealing with the industry for many years. For a long time, there was a drop in market shares. Uh, to give room to China and India, Turkey, uh, who were the new competitors. But over the past few years, there has been a recovery. And the Italian market share, as you see here, is underestimated for a part of the market shares uh, attributed to Switzerland are made by it ma made in Italy jewels uh, down to Ireland. Uh, the uh, share attributed to Ireland, uh, is not a producer, as a matter of fact, is the uh, outcome of the shifts of uh, logistic um, or headquarters to that country, uh, which is causing a drop for Switzerland. So in the end, the trend is positive, says the moderator, and this is not to be taken for granted. Uh, this scenario is a on growth. Here we have uh, four uh, companies making forecasts. Uh, there is a consensus on the fact that this fast recovery is not just uh, a flame, but it 
could be better consolidated in the coming years, in particular for the top of the range. Uh, as for the demand uh, at wealth level is growing, uh, the price of gold will remain pretty high, even though we expect it to slightly go down after the impact of more uh, when monetary policies are, uh, you know, retrieved. Uh, challenges for the future. Well, everything depends on the ability of Italian companies to concentrate on the top of the range items and the uh, good uh, quality of manufacturing, which is supported by the supply chain, which is very community based. Uh, we have to continue to invest on that, undoubtedly. At the same time, we have to invest more on four key items which are important digital and e-commerce, uh, even in this uh, industry, which was not so affected by this trend in the past, the ability to communicate and to have good digital marketing. Uh, the brands, uh, only 13% of companies uh, in Italy have an international uh, registered brand. Those who invest uh, uh, well in that are even less. Another key element uh, highlighted by the pandemic is sustainability. Uh, in the field of jewelry, it's not only the environment, but also uh, ethical issues. How can that be sustainable? Indeed, we need people, we uh, training. And as we said before, we have to support uh, the supply chain and keep it in Italy. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Stefania Trenti, for providing us with a quick resume of the situation. So the next quarter will make the difference, and so will 2022. And we have heard that there is this raw material issue with disrupted supply chains, with prices soaring in all industries and also in ours. But let's have a look at the structural changes, the deepest changes after this one and a half years. As you all know, there are temporary crises and everything is back to normal after that, but this is not the case of the pandemic. I mean, this is a watershed. It has changed the world. Just like the 11th of September 20 years ago, the world is different before the 11th of September and after the 11th of September. And it will be different before COVID-19 and after COVID-19 for the whole society, but also for the whole chain. Saying in Italian that there's something that changed history and that changed also industries. So what was the impact of the pandemic on the diamond industry? And what was re your reaction in front of such a huge, ch huge change? It's, it's impossible to underplay the impact that this has had on, on the industry. I mean, I was here um, in January 2020, mm -hmm. and, uh, and who would have thought then that uh, we were going to see the sort of impact we had? We heard a little bit about China, January 2020, but nothing uh, prepared us. I remember having a meeting in February where we were calculating Oh, well, if we lose one quarter of sales in China, that could be like 3% impact on our global sales for the year. It couldn't have been more inaccurate. Um, I have never, I've been in the diamond jewelry business 40 years. I've never, ever seen anything with the profound impact that this had. Particularly in the short run, the first half of 2020, uh, there was a period where all the diamond mines were shut. The Indian Cutting Center, where 94% of all diamonds are cut and polished, was shut. Jewelry manufacturing around the world was closed. And at one point, there was one month uh, in the second quarter where 93% of all jewelry stores in the world were closed. So it could not, I could not have imagined a scenario of that impact. Um, and it had a profound impact, particularly on the mining sector. I mean, our sales were, were several billion dollars below budget and forecast. Um, so the first impact was dramatic. What was interesting, and we talk a bit about later, is that the consumer came back first. The consumer came back to buy before the industry had really uh, reopened which in the end created some interesting long-term benefits for us, and we can talk in a second. 
I think the other big impact, probably for all of us in the room, is that we had to transition from being business people to suddenly <coughs> health experts. Um, never in my life that I would think that I would have more meetings about how we keep our people safe mm -hmm. and our communities safe. In the beginning, it was about how do we keep people from dying? It wasn't about how do we run our business mm -hmm. sure. even in that environment. First, we had to protect people. And this has been a real challenge for us, in, in, particularly in Southern Africa, where the health infrastructure is not what it is in the Western world and where vaccines are only today being distributed. Uh, so health was really important. Then we had to learn how to, uh, how to re restart our business while still pe keeping people safe. And we had to learn a whole new set of, uh, uh, of ways in which to work. And that's been a real, uh, I think, success of our ability uh, to be resilient as an industry in the face of this really traumatic uh, uh, change. And then thirdly, and I think this is probably the most important thing for the long run, we have to recognize that the consumer for diamond jewelry has changed. They have been mentally changed by the experience that they've gone through, uh, having uh, in many places been, in effect, locked down with their families for mm -hmm. 18 months, huh? on, and, on and off. And it's changed their attitudes toward what products they want to buy. Um, I think to the benefit of the jewelry sector, if we grab that opportunity. And I think it's dramatically changed what they look for from uh, brands. We saw a little bit in the presentation just now about the importance of responsible business. I think it's even beyond that. I think consumers, having experienced COVID, recognize that what happens in one part of the world cannot be isolated anymore. Yeah, sure. And what it impacts somewhere impacts us all. And that's raised, I think, in their minds, the importance of companies wherever we operate operating in a way that helps to solve some of the problems that the world faces. They want to see a positive impact from brands. And, and, and there's some really exciting data about the jewelry sector, that jewelry brands that can positively uh, demonstrate positive impact and positive purpose, mm -hmm. a sense of purpose, are projected to grow 25 to 35% per annum mm -hmm. for the next five years compared to a market that's going to grow three to four percent. So this is absolutely huge. This is a very strong push also for industries towards more transparency. Is this why you just launched a code of origin of all your diamonds? Yeah, I think we recognize that the, that the future, I should say probably I'm now more optimistic about the jewelry business than I ever have been before. I was probably a year ago pretty pessimistic. It seemed like, oh, this is going to be hard. Now I'm extraordinarily optimistic, but there's a lot of work for us to do. I think I'm optimistic because I know from my own experience that, that there is hardly a product in the world compared to a diamond uh, and the jewelry that it comes in, but particularly the diamond that has an extraordinarily positive impact in the communities from where it comes. And that's true of De Beers in Botswana, South Africa, and Namibia. It's also true of other major players like Al Rosa, uh, who have a hugely positive impact in mm -hmm. the communities in Yakutia uh, that need that impact. Um, we've got an amazing story to tell about how we protect the natural world. We've got an amazing story to tell about how we're empowering women in the mining communities. And if we can tell that story, you know, the challenge is telling it. Huh? So if we can tell that really persuasively, we are going to, to grab this consumer interest in products which create positive impact. And to do that for us at De Beers, we can, we can tell our story about, about De Beers and our what we call Building Forever, our program that's focused on the natural world, focused on diversity, focused on uplifting communities. We can tell that, but we can't connect it to the products that people buy and the jewelers, mm -hmm. manufacturers use and the jewelers sell. And with this concept of the code of origin, it's our way to connect the positive impact that De Beers mm -hmm. creates in its communities all the way through to the diamond that a, that a jeweler uh, you know, in Napoli could sell to their consumer. And they can feel then part of this positive impact story in a way that an individual jeweler, not 
directly associated with the, with the Mani communities can do so on his own. Allora, Jérôme Favier, già prima del Covid noi parlavamo di alcune di queste... Jérôme Favier, uh, prior to Covid, we were talking about these changes and the way how consumers try to find brands uh, that prepare their values. So maybe there will be an inscription on the De Beers diamonds to certify the origin and the relationship with the communities and the brand is very strong. So how did you actually change this? It's the customer who is uh, looking for a brand with uh, its content and its authenticity. And uh, this crisis has strongly accelerated uh, this uh, demand. At uh, Damiani, we are doing a major effort. Uh, as you said uh, exactly, uh, being a brand uh, is not enough. 12% uh, uh, of uh, Italian companies invest in the international brand. So uh, it's good uh, to make all the world know that. Cato, uh Stefania Trenti has also described how the market, especially after COVID, has taken on this uh, hourglass shape with excellent results for um, high market brands and the ones for a wider consumer base. So which is your position in relation to this? Well, as uh, we have six brands in our group, uh, so uh, we have uh, basic price uh, uh, up to the top of the range with Damiani. As a matter of fact, uh, we see that there has been an increase, as you said, after a major drop in the business, uh, in the whole world. So uh, hopefully what we uh, see uh, uh, now is just the end of a V-shaped uh, crisis with a very strong uh, recovery from basic to the top of the range. As a matter of fact, uh, the world of uh, brand jury, and I agree with Stefan, I have a very positive attitude to the long-term future uh, in the uh, watch uh, industry. Uh, you demonstrated that uh, between branded and non-branded, 80% is non-branded and uh, the rest is branded. So we have really a lot of room for maneuver to acquire uh, new share market shares and position them. Well, we know that what has happened in these one and a half years has made us jump forward five to 10 years in terms of accelerated digitization. There are many people who did not even think of doing e-commerce or buying services and receiving pharmaceutical prescriptions online. So things have changed and also your world, the luxury world, the jewelry world has changed. I remember some years ago at meetings like this ones, we used to say, no, the purchasing experience is going to be paramount and will have to be physical inflation bones. Online, as we've just seen, in 2025, we represent almost 20% of the turnover versus a 12% in 19. Do you agree with this? Have you made a similar experience? Indeed, during the lockdown, we uh, had uh, by five uh, increase uh, in sales on uh, e-commerce. 
Uh, yeah, we have not achieved the right level. Uh, it, that is never achieved. We are lagging behind. But anyway, I, I have a different uh, frame of mind. Uh, uh, being multi-channel is key because customers they change. There is a point at contact point which might they might start at the uh, brick and mortar, then go online, or vice versa. Uh, they want the touch and feel experience. Uh, uh, we speak about uh, an experience with different touch points uh, because of lockdown, because of the crisis, and uh, uh, as you know, we also have a distribution network in Italy so that we can have important partners in Italy with uh, 10 different touch points. In the end, uh, uh, it's difficult to tell where the customer uh, came to the decision uh, to uh, buy, but I would be cautious uh, uh, before quoting numbers. That it's a long journey, uh, which is very important in the experience. Mr. Fazoli, how do you see what we have just heard and which was your experience in this phase? Well, I have seen huge geographical, micro-geographical differences. Um, for instance, people living in cities had a different feeling and a different experience of the whole situation compared to those who live in the mountains. The digital acceleration is faster in big cities if you are in the periphery, so to say, you are peripheral also in digital terms because logistics is not that efficient. And we have seen this discrepancy. I mean, there are consumers who are ready to buy with a click today, but there are still consumers 20 kilometers away who are still lagging behind, five or 10 years behind compared to people living in large cities. This should never be undervalued because um, a country is made of many different situations. In big cities, we have quick commerce, queue commerce. In one hour, you get to your home what you desire. But logistics and the availability of the wideband is not uniform. So hopefully, our recovery plan will take us uh, to the next level in the coming years. How did you react to this? I mean, you represent you're the fifth generation in your company. So which is your role if you want to cast a glance into the future? Well, we have tried to accelerate our digital visibility since we had to close our stores. And we have done this with our customers, the customers we already had. So I asked my staff to start working contacting people, also the family members, their friends, their relatives, since we could no longer attract people in stores. I mean, I'm talking of stores like the one in Venice, where we had a 99.9% .9 drop in customers, and there you couldn't do much, you know, because those were only occasional uh, customers who actually live on the other side of the world. Well, Mr. Lucier told us that consumers um, came back first. Did you have a similar experience? Also, Damiani told us that sales never stopped. So how do you see the present situation? Well, I personally visited my customers. I went to their homes, door to door. Yeah, we went back to door to door, from globalization to door to door. We went to the customers with our briefcase and the jewels in it. It was a matter of survival, really. Yes, and when talking in such a personal way with your customers, which was their reaction? Do you think your customers have changed? I mean, you have known them for many years. You know their approach. You know what they look for. Have they changed? Well, many customers uh, decided to buy a present for themselves because they had survived. And that was a really emotional experience also for ourselves. Yes, I know also because you are rooted in areas that have been stricken so badly, the Brescia and Bergamo area. But let's now move to the side of production. I mean, in Venice this morning, I interviewed Mr. Brunetta 
the Ministry of Public Administration in Italy, who claimed everybody has to go back to work in their offices. Well, in an industry like yours, smart walking for the production of jewelry uh, is not ideal, I believe. So how did you react to this? And what have you learned as far as smart working is concerned? Indeed, uh, those people who can uh, work from home in Italy is 30%, uh, but in manufacturing, it's about 10%. Uh, uh, we have 70 people in our company who can work from home. Uh, so the uh, initial impact at the beginning of the lockdown time was um, a huge one. Let me remind you that the manufacturing communi community we are part of decided to lock uh, one week in advance since the uh, from the national decision. So in the first part of the lockdown, uh, we were uh, trying to uh, support people at home who uh, were not in a position to work from home because uh, those working in the manufacturing plant were doing nothing at home. So our first need was uh, to uh, understand how people were experiencing uh, what was happening, trying to understand the small or big signs of uh, stress in order to support people. Then, uh, later on, uh, from May onwards, we uh, tried to um, live uh, with a, a lot of uh, caution the coming back to the uh, uh, shop uh, going beyond uh, health uh, safety protocols we decided to work on shifts so that people uh, uh, did not have to meet the others everything was evolving so nobody could uh, foresee the consequences of the pandemic in the long term so after experiencing uh, the first uh, uh, serum screening tests made uh, in the plant, uh, luckily, uh, starting from November of last year, using uh, swabs in the company, uh, we uh, could uh, go again uh, full engine and the market was starting to recover. So I, I could say that in the third phase we are going through, we've learned how to live together. As, uh, working from home, um, there are less uh, people doing that because uh, uh, people wanted to go back to the company. They wanted to experience the presence of their colleagues. So uh, today we are uh, working well. So we all have had to reinvent ourselves, including ourselves, a TV channel. We had to do things that we didn't even think about in the past. But in your field, uh, there is also innovation. You're a very sophisticated company that has developed on innovation, on finding new solutions. That's a key to your success. I mean, what happened with the pandemics? Did this slow down or not? Well, the impact on innovation uh, has been huge. Uh, some things have uh, to be set aside, but I confirm what the others said. Investing uh, on the digital, that means e-commerce, but also the digital tools which help us to uh, do uh, our job better, that is digital tools and technologies which can uh, support our sales force in the after sale uh, stage, including uh, tools to collaborate with our suppliers. So uh, when at home, uh, many people uh, invested in that. When they came back, uh, we all uh, went back to the old projects. Luckily enough, uh, no project was abandoned. And we are trying to make up for the time lost. 
But looking at the uh, market perspectives, uh, I think uh, that uh, we want to stimulate this machine further. Very interesting. Consumers came back first, and this is a long-term benefit for us, mm. for the industry. At the same time, we know that the speed of the demand, pent-up demand, versus how the offer coped is, is a mismatch, which is creating some troubles. And from that perspective, some says we have to expect also in this industry that there will be less choice and higher prices looking ahead. Do you agree? And what's your expectation? Yeah, I think I, I, think I said that <laughs> about a month ago. Oh, okay, so that's uh, where I read and, it. Okay. And, um, and it's, I think the dynamic, so if you imagine um, the mines closed and the Indian cutting center is closed, so no new rough diamonds were being manufactured into polished diamonds. Uh, but the consumer, as I said, came back quicker than any of us expected by, um, you know, by August of 2020, we were seeing sales that were already at 2019 levels in America, the biggest market. Um, if you look at America over the, from that point to this point, I, it's been the strongest demand in history. I mean, American diamond jewelry demand, uh, jewelry demand in, in America so far this year is about 100% up on last year. Well, that's maybe not so hard but 40% up on 2019. 40% up 40 on 2019 on in the US. Never have we seen anything of that, of mm -hmm. that strength. And if you imagine an Indian cutting center and a retail center that can't be resupplied with new diamonds because uh, the first not being mined, but even if they were, they're not being cut and polished because India is shut in, in, the, in the first part of 2020. So what had to happen? Um, inventory levels, which were probably bloated in our diamond sector, um, uh, were run down because all you could sell is what you already had. So the, the Indian polishing centers decreased their inventories. All of those diamonds that they've never been able to sell, you know, things that we in the industry call left shoes because they're hard to sell, all sold. Retailers in America had to sell what was in their inventory. So they sold things that maybe they've had for six years, seven years, sold because that's what there was. The consumers were there and the new diamonds weren't coming back. What that's actually done though is put the business in a much healthier financial situation than it was before because uh, inventory le uh, levels are now at a much more manageable level. They've turned the old inventory into cash. So their bank debts are in better positions. The, the bank balances or the balance sheets are better and consumers are still there. So what are we living off now? Yep, the, the, the production's happening again. Diamonds are being cut and polished in India. Uh, again, we've learned how to operate in this COVID world uh, more effectively. But the demand is still running, in my view, ahead of the, the available supply. And so where three years ago you could say, I want a 1.2 carat G VVS1 and can I have it tomorrow? And can you ship it to me? Uh, now the answer is probably, well, not quite. Huh? We can get you something close, but we can't get you that. And so that's lifted prices. You know, from our perspective, that's a good thing. Uh, we need diamond prices to rise because, because uh, uh, discovering diamonds, new diamonds, takes money and getting them out of the ground takes more money than it did. So we need diamond prices to rise to keep the supplies. Uh, yeah, I understand in. your point of view. At that's the same our, time, that's, that's <laughs> our point of view. It's good. I think it's good in the long run because it means. So we'll would have you supplies. suggest? Would you suggest to shop early if anybody wants to make a present for Christmas, for example? I think it's good to get 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 them while the getting's good. Uh. <laughs> Jérôme Favier, com come vede questa situazione incide anche per voi quanto in questo momento è facile rispondere alla domanda. So we can now see that uh, the demand is a Well, indeed, this is a major challenge. Uh, this form of recovery, which in, indeed is very good and promising for uh, the manufacturing, uh, the sourcing, the distributors, uh, is going very fast. As Stefan said, this is good uh, because it indeed it, it, it cleaned uh, 
the market and all make up for the mistakes we made. That's why uh, Damiani Group uh, has uh, focused on icon items, limiting the ranges. Luckily enough, we have a lot of icon items and we are focusing on that. We are uh, trying to uh, be more productive so that we can react to the huge demand uh, that we hope could uh, continue. This has started in Italy, as Stefania Trenti told us, it has started again internationally. And in the last few years, you've made big step forwards to internationalize your brand and your distribution, especially towards China. Could you please update us on the present situation? Well, indeed, uh, the world snapshot is different. We have 65 shops, outlets in the world. Last year, we doubled our sales in Korea. Now we are doubling again the sales there, so the world is uh, very varied. As for China, indeed, we have recently signed a joint venture with the Fosun Group, uh, which is owned by uh, Yuan Yuan, uh, a, a top brand in terms of Falun's and then uh, and others of uh, Chinese jewels. Uh, more than uh, 2,500 uh, outlets so that Salvini and Damiani, uh, our key brands, can be uh, expanded in China. We have a strong plan. Well, the demand in China never stopped. Last year, uh, it had a four-fold increase because Chinese people could no longer travel. So uh, demand is very, very strong in China, uh, only on internationally branded jewelry. Uh, I'm French, but I must admit that uh, the Chinese people, Chinese people love uh, Italy and the Made in Italy products. So, uh, so uh, very timely, we have implemented this development plan and we are, um, you know, uh, ripening the first fruits. Uh, we opened a flagship store in Shanghai for Damiani. Soon uh, uh, we will uh, open a Salvini items uh, flagship uh, in uh, uh, Shanghai. Massimo Fasoli, I mean, when you hear manufacturers and miners being congested in a way, uh, well, everybody is experimenting this kind of difficulties also in other industries. So are you worried? Are you going to have enough jewelry for Christmas presents? Will you have to auction them? Or do you believe that the situation is quiet from your viewpoint? Well, I believe that uh, we have experienced uh, something similar. During the lockdown, we used what we had in stock. So it is true. Now there are some difficulties. Are you now receiving new deliveries? Well, as far as some brands are concerned, I can see that the products are not really available. A tight market, in other words. Yeah. What have you done in the last few months? I mean, did you also look at other international examples to see how they tackle the situations? And do you believe there is somebody who did things properly or uh, did everybody go in the same direction as you did? Well, I always try to be inspired because I'm sure there's always somebody who's better than me uh, investing in research and studies. So I have my references and um, I'm not uh, giving you the names now, but you know, uh, could you let us know which one of these ideas have inspired you most. Well, dynamic contents compared to static contents will make the difference in the coming years. I'm talking about photography and digitization. So if you can show the jewel alive, um, even if you're not in a store, can be of help. Mr. Rapone, when we talk about production, uh, we have to focus on the size as well. How you react? 
Well, uh, I uh, must admit that the industry uh, is keeping uh, its position. We advanced the purchase of uh, colored gemstone. We have exceeded uh, wider uh, lead times. Um, in the view of different uh, bases of recovery all over the world, that has uh, uh, implied uh, uh, an increase in prices. Well, um, in the supply chain, we have had so far no major problems. Uh, in uh, colored uh, gemstones, not in diamonds, uh, uh, there is a risk of uh, uh, rough uh, stones uh, shortage, like emeralds, rubies, and so on. Uh, there's very uh, fast recovery and the uh, interest of uh, brands uh, uh, which never purchased uh, stones uh, uh, higher than five uh, carats. Well, our suppliers of uh, precious stones are complaining. Uh, so the uh, we have not yet weathered the storm. We have to be uh, very uh, cautious in the coming months. No major impact. Which are the signals coming from the distribution? Uh, what about demand? Well, it's very high. You know, we ha are very strong in China, so uh, that uh, was a, a, a moment of destabilization because the first market to collapse was China, but it was the first to recover. And they did that very, very fast at a speed we had not expected, and it, it, it's still uh, going uh, very well. Um, going back to other Asian countries. You mentioned Korea. Korea is the second uh, quickest growing market uh, uh, after uh, China as compared with 2019. Uh, there is a lot to do. Stefania Trenti. Growth and growth problems. It sounds like a boom. I mean, it is wonderful to have some growth problems compared to what we've experienced in the past one and a half years. In Venice, there has been a big meeting of large distribution and those who produce for um, large consumption goods, you know. But um, also in the field of food and beverage, for instance, uh, uh, prices may go up by 5-10% in the coming months. This is no good news, okay? A little bit of inflation is good, but if consumers then have to cut down on their consumption because their wages did not increase and growth might decrease, inflation and low growth, in other words, stagflation, this is not a good prospect. How do you see this in your industry confronted in an excessive demand? versus the capability of industries to react. <laughs> what a difficult question. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, what you said so far on the mismatch uh, or the creation of bottlenecks uh, because of the lockdown and so on in the world, that might be one of the reasons of uh, possible slowdown of the Italian economy, economy in the next quarter. Uh, I'm not referring to jewelry uh, only, but for example, the building sector is going through a boom because of the uh, national incentives. And uh, there, uh, there are problems of labor and materials, and that might contribute to uh, a slowdown uh, uh, of the economy in the coming quarters. The inflation, as you said, uh, is more under control. Indeed, uh, prices of production are going up between 5 to 10 percent, depending on the industry. But as a matter of fact, well, it, 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 it does not um, 
reverberate down to the final consumer. So uh, the inflation rate will not uh, justify uh, substantial changes in monetary uh, policies, um, if not for 2022. What is interesting, if I may, is that if we consider uh, the uh, manufacturing goods uh, from Italy in terms of consumer goods, the booming demand uh, is there for jewels, but also for other uh, durable goods, for example, uh, uh, houses, cars, uh, because we have incentives also for that. So the paradigm has changed. The uh, uh, jewels is uh, important, uh, which people want, and because they want to be gratified. The same goes for, uh, you know, renovating the house after the lockdown. Uh, uh, so there is a change of mentality uh, of consumers in Italy and in other countries, and thus uh, uh, is in favor of uh, the uh, jewels. So uh, I'm not going to favor the beers, but a diamonds forever is a good idea. People want to buy uh, things uh, which are not ephemeral, something which can last over time, gratify, but uh, uh, with a big value. It works. So, yes, this is probably the number one motivation for purchase or is this an investment? How do consumers react? Well, this is a, an atypical investment, an alternative investment, very alternative, I would say, because I mean, the number one motivation is because it is beautiful, because you want to pass it down to future generations, because you want to tell something to another person. I never propose jewelry as an investment. I work on other types of motivations. Well, I would like to ask uh, um, another question. I mean, Stefania has reminded us that it is not just the problem of raw materials or logistics, but also the availability of uh, talents and people working uh, with um, Jérôme Fabier, we were talking about this last year. It is necessary to attract young people and to focus on a generational change. Is there still a priority as the situation changed? Well, better or worse, well, uh, the lock down and the reopening, uh, well, that has been very difficult. Indeed, we were uh, believing in the future. We are small in a very big world. And we had created the Damiani Academy. I'm very glad for that uh, because we hired uh, 25 new workers who got their certificate at the Academy to, uh, you know, support the uh, being able to do, making it Italian. It uh, takes a lot of time to achieve excellence. Indeed, it's a major challenge. I'd like to react to what you said before, and rightly so, on customers. Thanks to the lockdown, we uh, see that now customers are uh, very well trained and educated. They have spent a lot of time uh, in front of the computer training themselves. Uh, in the past, we had uh, to do a lot of uh, advisory work. Uh, it's a trend that had already started. I, I think that uh, customers are well prepared, are ready, very well uh, educated and trained on diamonds and jewels. So uh, why, uh, uh, well, the, the meaning of a purchase and the value of the brand and the history uh, uh, and authenticity, that has been a major change, which I want to stress. This is another very interesting aspect, that is uh, consumers who have become more mature. Raponi, do you actually find the people to work with? Well, as far as the value chain is concerned, I'm pretty optimistic. But as far as human resources, I am a pessimist. 
we have to accelerate. We've got some big issues. I mean, this is what we are still missing in our industry and in our cluster as well. So initiatives like Damiani's, as well as our, we also have an internal academy, are a good thing. But the whole industry must invest in proportion to everybody's capacities. But we must invest on the future, on the future of our industry and craftsmen of the future of our industry. So thank you for your question, because it allows me to say that together with Damiani and other brands, we have set up an initiative, Fondazione Umani Intelligenti, with the purpose of stimulating the community and provide education with the participation of companies to the development of an educational process that can attract young people in our industry. So there's still a lot to do. What's the key message, the takeaway that you want to leave to all the participants and the market participants of your industry here from Vicenza? I think from De Beers' perspective, it's probably that we have huge opportunity, but the world has changed and we need to recognize that. And the change means that our consumers changed. They're interested in this idea of brands first. Brands are going to grow most strongly in our sector purposeful brands or brands that, that, that stand for something beyond what they sell are going to grow f even faster. And if you don't know how to sell through e-commerce, you've got a big problem uh, <laughs> because the consumer, to our benefit, during the downturn, learned how to buy diamond jewelry on e-commerce. And now that the stores are all open, they've gone back to the stores and they're buying, but they haven't given up their attachment to e-commerce. It's incremental business to us. And we need to be really good at that going forward if we're going to compete with the luxury goods. So lots, lots of exciting stuff, but we have to be better at different things than we were before the Molto crisis. Optimismo ancora in queste parole. Massimo Fasoli, come guardate voi al futuro? Thank you for your optimism. Mr. Fasoli, how do you look towards the future? Which are your projects for 2022? Well, uh, considering that a brand goes directly to consumers, indeed, uh, it's a major challenge against major players. But we have to uh, find a new way uh, to relate with customers, to make them uh, understand that we can be very close to them personally. Well, uh, it, it's more difficult to do that uh, behind the screen of a PC. We have to lay emphasis on the relationship with customers. The relationship with the customer is as important as a turnover for companies. So personal contact is fundamental. Raponi, Bulgari, how do you look towards the next step and which is the message you leave to Vicenza? Well, we are very optimistic on the future. We have a wide market. We have a showcase on the world. It's a symbolic showcase that the jury, and we want to continue to invest in this country also in terms of production structures. So we see. Uh, uh, growth in the future. This is very important. So investing in the community, investing in our Made in Italy brand. Jerome Favier, you know that I like to titillate you. What about your projects? I mean, we know that aggregations are paramount because it is a global play. You've done several operations in the past. Do you have any ideas for the coming future? Uh -huh, you always want to know our secrets. Well, we usually say that we live on a planet where there are giants such as Richemont, Elvier Marsh, Kering. And we are the smallest of the big ones. I mean, uh, this is a small family group with six brands, 100% private, uh, totally made in Italy. And we are trying to aggregate with some other local entities. Yeah, I told you that we have been investigating some possibilities and we've just concluded an initiative 
starting a partnership with a well-known retailer in Sicily, Zimiti, and we are the majority shareholders now. So to conclude, I would say partnership is a word. It's a catchword. The world is becoming very complicated. It is very volatile. You cannot work on your own. We've seen this. So partnerships are fundamental. And on the supply side, as well as on the distribution side, you need to have partners. Nobody can work on their own. You have to have partners to tackle these challenges, which are very positive challenges. But, you know, you have to make big decisions, and it is a size issue. The world is very big. A lot of investment is required. It is a race towards becoming big enough to be a winning competitor. So that's our word. Well, partnership is a beautiful word with which I would like to conclude our meeting with the pandemic. A lot of barriers have been eliminated between companies that used to be competitors in the past. And cooperation and partnership have developed. Stefania Trenti. Did you find something particularly interesting for your next report? Yes, indeed. Uh, I've gathered a lot of ideas. What's your takeaway? Well, my takeaway is the idea of partnership. That is indeed very important. Uh, not to use the so much abused, uh, let's be a system. But in particular, as regards training, uh, the uh, putting in order the public training system in such an industry, that will be key to be able to bear and support these growth rates in terms of digitalization, manufacturing and marketing capacity, internationalizations. We need people. Very true. So. A new month, September, a new season, a new world. Optimism and confidence, as we've just heard. So thank you very much to Massimo Fasoli, Nicola Raponi, Joran Fazier, Stefan Lucy, Stefania Trenti. Thank you for being here with us today. Let's put our hands together for our panelists. Thank you very much to the people in Vicenza. Thank you very much to the people who were remotely connected with us. See you soon. <laughs>